Welcome to episode 792 of Carcon Carne. The show tonight, today, whenever you're listening, is sponsored by SopelSolar.com, S-O-P-E-L, solar.com. I'm recording this the first week of November, which means the year is kind of winding down, which seems astonishing to say, but now is the time to go solar. Take advantage of the tax credits that are floating out there. Get those panels on your home before the weather becomes inclement, shall we say. It costs nothing out of pocket, and you can increase the value of your home automatically. The second those things are up, your home value is already improved. Nothing out of pocket. The consultation is free. Let my friend Brent Sopel help you achieve cost certainty. Carcon Carney, also sponsored by 90 Days in the 90s, a rock and roll time travel story. It is the ultimate novel about the 90s and Chicago's music scene. I was there. Maybe you were there. If you weren't, you can go back in time and relive the 90s in Chicago. That is the whole idea of this book, 90 Days in the 90s, written by Andy Fry. You can join record store owner Darby as she takes a trip back to the 90s. She takes the gray line back in time to time travel to those carefree, amazing days that were filled with music memories, pop culture memories, 90daysinthe90s.com. Are you using the video or not using the videos? Or just for reference, I, or are you using it? I, it doesn't I, matter. I'm just curious. I, I'd like I to, should. if that's okay. Yeah, of course. All good. I mean, I mean, yeah, you're you're so photogenic, it would be wrong not to. Well, and then I'll I'll raise a toast to you, sir. So here we go. <laughs> Cheers. I, I wish I, I I wish I had something to to you drink. Sort I, of, you know, you could fist bump. It's like, yeah, boom. Right there on, bro. Go. There you go. Okay. Uh, so if you're cool, we'll begin. Baby, I'm mm. always cool. Let's do it. <laughs> Uh, my guest tonight, right now, it is Frank Meyer. He's an award-winning director, producer, author, and musician. His band, Streetwalk and Cheetahs, recorded over 10 albums, appeared on over 100, that doesn't even seem right, 100 compilations, soundtracks, and tribute albums, and picked up a lot of kick-ass press along the way. Uh, Frank is here. He's enjoying a cocktail as he should. It's it's nighttime. He deserves an adult beverage. Sure. Sure. I mean, why not? Sure. Yeah. You know, Frank... I've been I've interviewed bands a lot through the years, and the, the cardinal rule is you never ask a band who their influences are. That always seems kind of like a cliche, crutchy kind of thing to do. Although I feel like with Streetwalk and Cheetahs, you've always worn them on your sleeve, and with this new release, like it, it's kind of hard not to. Yeah, I, I mean, I think my whole career has sort of been like saluting my idols and my influences, and then sort of taking you know all these things that I enjoy and putting them into blender. And that's the music I make. So with this new cheetahs record, the street walking cheetahs, all the covers and more, it's, it's literally a collection of all the covers we did between when the band formed in 1995 and our very first demo featured us uh, like a four track cassette demo doing a mix of covers and originals. And really early on, we teamed up with people like Cherie Curry from the runaways and Wayne Kramer from the MC five and Sylvain Sylvain from the New York dolls and kind of started, you know, sort of doubling as their backing band, but also like talking them into doing remakes of their songs or guesting on our material, just whatever we could pull off. We, like you said, we always wore influences pretty uh, well on our sleeves. So this new album makes a lot of sense. Uh, at the same time, that's why we're called the street walking cheetahs is that like we started yeah. and we were playing, you know, runaways and, and, and stooges covers. So like street walking cheetah with the heart full and napalm, that's the opening line and search and destroy. And one of the first rehearsals we ever did, we, we played black to Calm by the MC five and cherry bomb by the runaways and search and destroy. Mm -hmm. And then it sounded good. And after a few rehearsals, we we're like, let's book a gig, but we didn't really know what we were yet, but we knew that we were doing all these awesome covers. And we're like, well, anyone that figures out what the street walking cheetahs even means is going to kind of know what we're all about. And if they don't, you know, fuck them. And they just think we're like some <laughs> no name band and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, which we were at the time until Cherie Curry from the Runaways came and saw us really early on and jumped up on stage and sang Cherry Bomb and then did this single that's now like the lead single you know, uh, on our new record, but was also a single we put out back in the 90s of us doing Cherry Bomb with Cherie. So it all goes full circle. And to answer your original question, yeah, I mean, our influences are pretty clearly the Stooges and the MC5 and the Dead Boys and the Runaways. But I think Cheap Trick is is a big one. We're, we're really big power pop fans. So we really dig those songs that like have like great, like hard edge riffs and then really melodic vocals. That's kind of like my 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 go-to thing you know well, i'm glad you said cheap trick and we'll talk about 
the fact that Cheap Trick is covered and represented here a couple times uh, on this compilation. Sure. I've got one more drink behind me. You can see the vinyl perched yep, yep. over my right shoulder. I, I mean, Ain't It Summer off that album just sounds like it, that is total Cheap Trick. Yeah, I mean, that's there's a few songs that we have that in my mind as as the as the guy that, you know, wrote or co-wrote those songs like that song and look out and December in a day. And those are songs, you know, covering several decades of the band. But um, those are like overt cheap trick sort of salutes. You know what I mean? Like it's not, I'm not even like trying to pretend like I'm, I'm being <laughs> just being like, this is me doing my, my take on the cheap trick sound. And uh, you know, they're just, they're along with, the Ramones and Van Halen with David Lee Roth and the Go-Go's and Joan Jett. I mean, those are some of the like primordial influences for me, not necessarily all the rest of the guys, although they all love those bands, but we each have, you know, the bands that like made us play music in the first place. And for me, Cheap Trick was for sure. One of those bands where like, that was what got me addicted to listening to the radio was Cheap Trick. You know, like every time I heard Surrender or She's Tight or If You Want My Love, You Got It, I was just like, oh, my God. I, I would just like sit waiting for them to come on the radio, you know. Yeah, you know, growing up in Illinois and hearing all those oh, yeah. songs Yeah, I mean, on the you're a Chicago the... guy, you know. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's... It's just that the idea as a kid, like, those guys are from the same state as me. Those guys are like drivable from where i live really it blew my young well, mind and also to me the thing that was cool like when i when i first got into music there were bands that were sort of like untouchably great and grand you know like like van halen with david lee roth was grand it was big zeppelin was big aerosmith was big yeah. the sex pistols even for all of their sort of ramshackleness like when you saw those pictures they looked like a big force of nature but like the ramones and the runaways and cheap trick to me looked a lot more like normal people you know what i mean like like you'd look at photos and this is back before the internet you would look at photos of these bands and you kind of just you know and again some of these bands are before my time like like i wasn't you know i'm a kid more of the 80s and i grew up in the 70s but i was a little kid back then you know by the time i was listening to music it was like the early 80s so i was like listening to the radio when like early joan jett and the go-go's and the yeah. first motley crew record and van halen diver down like 82 maybe was sort of when i first was like oh my god this music like the knack my sharona mm -hmm. oh mickey by uh tony basil that was you know kids in america by by mm -hmm. kim carnes that was the stuff that kind kim of wild. Made me go like kim wild yeah uh yeah kim carnes was uh betty davis eyes yes. um but yeah good call um but that was the stuff that kind of made me go from like kid with the radio on in the background to like oh my god this music is so it means so much to me and then i heard van halen and that was the thing that that really made me go like, I've got to pick up this guitar and figure out how to do that thing that I'm hearing. Cause like that was sort of what got me started as a musician, not necessarily yeah. as a kid that liked rock, but as a musician that wanted to learn an instrument, it was, it was the Van Halen stuff. But, but even that was so untouchably beyond my capabilities as a 13 year old, sure. it sort of took the Ramones and the Sex Pistols and T-Rex and the New York Dolls, that was sort of what made me start a band. Because, like, even Van Halen, even the idea of trying to play guitar, like, seemed so kind of still untouchable as a dream. Like, I don't know. I mean, I'm going to try playing this guitar, but, like, it's not going to go well. I can't do all this tapping stuff. But, like... uh you know, Eddie Van Halen eruption was like the thing back in the day. And you had to learn how to like tap and do whammy bars and all these like tricks. And I was like, I can't do that stuff. But when it, then I heard the New York Dolls and the Ramones and I was like, oh, I can do that. Like, that's mm -hmm. just three chords and those that's E, A, B. I know those. And so that kind of got me started in like I could form a garage band. And then I just kept aiming for trying to sort of be like the best musician I could within the context of this music that I enjoyed, which was really kind of just simple rock and you know, here we are 30 something, you know, years later. And, and and to some extent, my whole sound is still based on that primordial, you know, T-Rex, Hanoi Rocks, New York Dolls, you know, like I've done all these other records and I've like metal bands and country stuff with Eddie Spaghetti and James Williamson, yes. you know, all the like all this sort of wide range of material. But like when I, when left to my own devices, I'm kind of making the same music I that like. I was making the very first time I picked up a guitar, which is like Aerosmith meets Kiss meets Sex Pistols meets T-Rex meets New York Dolls, Hanoi Rocks. Like that's my that's my jam.
and, and I think we have all the same cultural touchstones. And Cheap Trick, of course, which is where and this cheap whole trick. thing. So, we, we cheap Trick to me is where it begins, ends. And they're my Beatles, honestly. And this is a, a terrible statement to make if you're a classic rock fan. I like the Beatles more than I like Cheap Trick. And even Cheap Trick would disagree with that statement. They go, you're out of your mind because we're only here because of the Beatles. And I, I agree with that statement. Like, I'm not discounting the majesty of the Beatles. But for me and my taste and my ears, I like Cheap Trick's harder take on that Beatles influence than I even like the fucking Beatles. And I know that's sacrilegious, but God damn it, I'm going to stick to it. Well, God, those first few albums, the self-titled one, Heaven Tonight, uh, uh, I in, mean, in listen, color. Homer Simpson said, he goes, I prefer the music of Cheap Trick. <laughs> and, and you're talking about the way they looked as, you know, Van Halen, they're almost like cartoon mythical gods, Van Halen and Zeppelin. Cheap trick. You had, you had the handsome guys, yeah, the, cute, had, the two cute guys, and then the nerds. And then the guys who look like they could yeah, be work, they working like, at a, sh a shoe store. Yeah, like or a Bunny Carlos. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but that was what's... And that's actually why when I mentioned the kind of Ramones connection yeah. is that, like, some of those bands... And we love these bands, but, you know, like Hanoi Rocks, the Pistols, Aerosmith, these bands look so perfectly cool. Cheap Trick, like two guys looked cool and the other two looked like guys that I hung out with or like right. their dads. Like they looked like normal dudes. Their whole look to me and the way that they their whole thing to me was very approachable. And their music, yeah. while very sophisticated, is also very simple, much like the Ramones and a lot of great music and, and and a lot of Beatles and a lot of Stones. You know, it's like you can kind of strum through it in like three or four or five chords. But then as you start to learn the the details and the intricacies, you're like, whoa, this is some some heavy stuff. There's a lot going on here, you know. Uh, one thing I, I it was kind of a reawakening or a relearning for me about the Ramones. And I, I do love the Ramones. I, in fact, one of the loudest concerts I ever saw was the Ramones at the Riviera in oh, Chicago. Yeah. Well, you know, I wrote a book called On the Road with the Ramones. The first I've written eight books. And the first book I wrote was called On the Road with the Ramones. And it was with Monty Melnick, who was their tour manager. And we interviewed like every person in the Ramones camp at that time. Uh, and and that's definitely I mean, I wrote that book up for a lot of reasons. And one of them is because the Ramones are are huge for me, you know. Uh, one th one relearning for me, record store day one or two record store days ago, they had the re releases of all the Ramones eighty stuff as like a box set, and I had to listen to those records for a while. So good, I they get dismissed. There's a ton of good stuff in there. The the Ramones really never made a bad record. I mean, there's definitely spottier records, and mm -hmm. maybe when you get into the nineties, but like. They're all really good. The ones with CJ are really good. The 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 stuff in the in the eighties is really good. Like, you know, Howling at the Moon, Mama's Boy, that stuff. Mama's like that Boy, stuff's God. killer. You know, I, I I really like a lot of that stuff a lot. And uh, the stuff with Richie Ramon sometimes gets slagged a little bit, but like, I feel like Joey and Johnny when they wrote songs together, or and especially when Dee Dee got in the mix, like they didn't write bad songs. There, there's uh, no real bad Ramon songs. They're all great. What? As far as the 90s go with Mondo Bizarro, I think Poison Heart is as good a single as they ever wrote. The, all the all those albums with with all those later records um, are really, really solid. And the Acid Eaters, the covers record yes. towards the end is really, really good. Like, I, I mean, I feel like CJ brought a lot of energy and a lot of sort of punk rockness to them at a time when, you know, maybe johnny and joey weren't communicating as much and cj was sort of like the middle ground like they all kind of were able to sort of um deal with each other through his love and energy it's like van halen when when wolfgang joined mm -hmm. you know what i mean it's like dave and eddie did not particularly get along but wolfie i feel like was had so much energy and genuine love and passion not just for his dad, but for the music and like a respect for what Dave right. brought, maybe a respect for what Dave brought that even Eddie and Alex maybe didn't quite quite have their heads wrapped around at that time. Like, obviously, they, you know, they, they know what Dave's worth. But but I feel like Wolfgang came in with this fresh perspective the way that CJ did was like, yeah, you guys don't get it, man. This is what people love. We got to do this like we got to bring it back to this thing, you know, and sometimes you need that. Like, I mean, I just believe it or not i just got off the kiss cruise oh wow i did okay. five days on the road at the kiss cruise uh me and amit zappa went because we're working on a project together that involved going on the kiss cruise long story <laughs> um he and i go way back and there's a lot of our 
a lot of our adventures where you'd go, wait, what, why, why are we doing that? I go, listen, man, long story. We go way back. We do crazy shit. But uh, Amit and I were on the kids cruise and, um, you know, that's a band that as much as I hate to admit it, like when they brought in Tommy Thayer and Eric Singer, who replaced and even wore the makeup, which many people found to be sacrilegious, <laughs> you know, but they wore the makeup of Ace Freely and, and Peter Chris, the cat man and the, and the space man. And even myself, and I'm actually, I'm a big fan of Tommy Thayer. He was in a band called Black and Blue, who I really like a lot. And like, like, so like, I was not hating on him joining Kiss, but you know, like the idea of them wearing the makeup at first, I was like, I don't know. But then I went and saw them with those guys and dude, they were so much better than when I saw the reunited Kiss in the, in the mid nineties with yeah. Ace and Peter, these guys play that stuff note for note spot on tons of energy they're bringing in this youthful vibe that paul and gene seem to really like feed off of and the couple records they made with those guys are really solid sort of throwbacks to the 70s and like yeah. i'm all about it man you know if, if you're gonna keep the band going then keep the band going you know what i mean you totally don't agree. be an oldies act like you know i don't mean like reinvent yourself i mean still give the people what they want but if you need to like you know sub out a few guys to just sort of keep this 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 thing happening like i get it man and in the case of kiss I, I feel like it was the right move and it bought them like another couple decades well and alice cooper does the same thing he's got yeah. young, young people keeping him absolutely in fact i saw alice and ace recently and ace was not so great and alice was absolutely like a master class in master class showmanship musicianship performance he sang great the band yep. was great it's a rotating cast of killer players. The last time I saw him a few years back before, you know, COVID, he had a slightly different tweak on the band. That band was killer. Like, guys, he's just, you know, he's killer. He, he, to me, he's right under the stones. And you know what I mean? In terms of like, you go and see an Alice Cooper show, you are seeing an A-list show killer there's 100 it, it, and you but you're also seeing a real band playing real music like meaning you can go see you know a fun arena band but like nine times out of ten it's all they're playing to like you know pre-recorded tracks and stuff right. and i don't even hate on that i'm just saying like you're not a lot of times you're not seeing the band but when you see the stones like other than a few like there's some elements that you know, a couple like maybe percussive you know few little things if they're playing two thousand miles from home there might be some keyboards flown yeah. in but like for the most part you know, you're getting the stones and, and their backing band, which at this point is huge, playing those songs. When you go and see, you know, uh, well, when I, when I went and saw Kiss on this cruise, it was the four guys. Like, yeah, there were a few bum notes. So what? It was killer. Right. 99% of what they played, they played it killer. That's awesome. All right. So yeah. all the covers and more is the new compilation. See, I, I was worried we, we get too far. I know. Down, we just went down the... this hole. I mean, we get to talk forever. For sure. <laughs> So 38 total covers dating back to the inception of the Streetwalk and Cheetahs. I've got to think mastering this was a nightmare just because of all the different sources. Well, not, not for me, because I, I farmed that out to other people. But for Lou uh, from from Rumbar Records, who was kind enough to put this out. Yeah, it had to have been a nightmare because a lot of stuff. Uh, there's a handful of tracks that came from albums because along the line we we're, you know, on some albums we would put on covers and then there's like some singles we did like the stuff with Cherie curry and the stuff with yeah. uh with dennis tech those were like singles that came out on bump records back in the day and so some of that stuff was already mastered but then we also had like four track you know cassette demos of the original lineup of the band with my brother brecken uh on drums right before his acting career took off and then we've got like unreleased stuff that came from adats and Dats and then a couple things where they were from vinyl and compilations where I didn't even have the masters, so we had to master them off the vinyl. Right. So like, yeah, it was a nightmare. But again, um, that's why you hire a professional team around you so that I personally don't have to deal with every single detail. <laughs> you know, I I have a bunch of my old inter interviews from the '90s on Dats, and I, I oh feel like dude, me it, too. it's a it's a it's a race against the clock before they completely disintegrate. You, oh, listen, I'm sitting here right now when we finish this interview. I bought a four track cassette player recently because I've got all these old school including a lot of cheetah stuff four track cassettes and i have no way to really offload them and right. to properly i mean honestly to because i have all the masters but to properly store it what you need to do is track at a time run it into your computer and you know what i mean but like that means a a, a, a half an hour long demo is actually two hours long right. because it's four times the length because yeah blah 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 
it's a fucking nightmare. <laughs> but that being said, like, who else is going to do it but me? And I was the guy in the band, you know, me and Dino from the band. We started the band. And, you know, going back to your original question, like, we're music nerds like you. Like, when we started this band, like, we knew, like, hold on to everything. If we do a four track, hold on. Because we figured just, like, we would collect Johnny Thunder's records and Gigi Allen and Iggy Pop and all those, like, cult artists, you know, that where you would, there'd be, like, 30 records on a French label that didn't even, you're like, what? How? Like, I love Johnny Thunder's. This, where did all these come from on like you know this revenge records or whatever you'd start going down this path and the, you, you know realize there was all these like bootlegs and official bootlegs and then when torrenting started there was like torrenting so we're nerds like that so along yeah. the way we saved everything and anytime we jammed with anyone famous or any, anyone cool we made sure we had some tape of it and now you know i mean i didn't even touch that stuff forever because i'm always kind of moving forward as you know i play yeah. in like 12 bands and i'm doing a record with eddie spaghetti and a record with james williamson and you know i got this band in copenhagen training aces and my blues band highway 61 but at the same time at some point i was like you know like this covers record made me kind of go like man i got so much stuff sitting on cassettes and adats and dats and like now's that now that i'm in archival mode now's the time so i'm starting to go through it all let me just give you an idea of how deep and insane this goes in the around 95 96 um i played in the schoolhouse rock touring band with bob duro and jack sheldon and Denny Sidewell and all of the original members and performers and vocalists who did Schoolhouse Rock. And I was the vocalist and guitar player at times. And I even brought Cherie Curry into the mix and she sang Suffer Until Suffrage, the song about the women's suffrage movement <laughs> from the singer of the Runaways, which no one else, you know, I was like, we got to do this. It's so ironic. Bob was like, well, I don't know who the Runaways are, but that sounds cool if you like it, Frank. And like we did this whole thing. And recently just going down, you know, all the covers and more putting together the Cheetahs record made me start kind of like I had to pull up some of the stuff from the four track demos. And I realized like, oh, my God, I have all these soundboard tapes and four tracks. And I started going through it. Dude, I've got three soundboard Schoolhouse Rock Live full shows. Oh, my God. With a, with Bob DeRoe, who's now rest in peace, he's not with us anymore. It's him. It's Jack Sheldon from you know who's like this famous actor, uh, trumpet player, uh, Denny Sidewell from Wings, the drummer of Wings on drums. Me, Cherie Curry, Insanity, and I've got all this stuff, and I'm now just starting to like archive it and figure out what to do with it all. Oh my God! All right, so some of the some of the songs you cover. I mean, it just this is the itch I didn't realize I needed scratch. I mean, you've got. Uh, you cover X. You, you perfectly conjure up John Doe. I love the uh, X scene part on that. The get out. I I love the way that. Well, works. Dino Dino does John Doe on that, and I do X scenes because he's got that natural baritone, like John Doe. And I, you know, my I, my voice, I can kind of I can kind of do whatever. Especially now, like when I started, I just kind of had like one or two ranges I could do. But I've been singing for a long time now, and I've sort of gotten to a point where, and I'm not saying this like egotistically. I'm just saying like this is my instrument like like i'm I'm a pretty good guitar player uh, i've become a really good singer in the sense that i feel like my range on guitar there's a lot more things on guitar that i can't do whereas a vocalist there's not a lot i can't do like i've done i've done plays now i've done schoolhouse rock tours i've sang with petra hayden when i sang with james williamson i've done stuff with thor or you know heavy metal guys where i've sang in like a full fucking you know super high register for the whole song not in falsetto like real you know head voice kind of stuff but like you know like i took vocal lessons over the years like i know how to use my voice as a tool as a weapon uh, the throat to me is an effects pedal it's like a distortion mm -hmm. pedal so like i i i choose whether i want to sound distorted or not you know don't get me wrong you sing long enough you're just going to start to get distortion on your voice because you'll blow it out but like generally if i'm in a good vocal form like it's all sort of choices now and i can kind of choose like oh here's that point where my voice you know m I, I could go into uh, a falsetto and jump up an octave or I could stay in head voice and jump up an octave. So now which tone do I want as opposed to the ability of jumping up to the note? Whereas for years and years, I couldn't get it. I was just kind of a tenor. Yeah, I was a tenor with a little bit of baritone. And now I'd say I'm just like, I, 
pretty much. I mean, there's some stuff I can't do, but for the most part, I can pretty much kind of sing anything for the most part. You mentioned Aerosmith at the beginning of our conversation. And one of my favorite singers ever. And another guy that can sing and Robin Zander too. anything. Oh, for sure. You know, well, just like way high, way low in the middle. It's always. And those are my idols. That's why I try to sing good. It's just so I can be like that, you know, uh, is or does draw the line, have one of the greatest riffs in rock history. Discuss. It does. It does. And it also has one of the coolest vocal things ever. Cause you know, there was a long time when like Axl Rose and, you know, Cinderella, Fast and Get, everyone was sort of doing their riff on the Steven Tyler thing, mm -hmm. which, which was, you know, Steven Tyler was originally a drummer. So a lot of those like scat vocals that he does are really him just singing drum fills. So he's like, you know, get, get, get. yeah, that's really just a drum going, -ga 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 you know what I mean? And so like, like like I started kind of learning like, oh, shit, he's just doing he's just jumping up to like a head voice, throwing some distortion on and doing a fucking drum fill. So like that whole thing. So like when we covered Draw the Line, I, I made sure not only do we get the riff right in the slide guitar, but I wanted to get that vocal part. You know, he's like, you know, mm -hmm. you know, that whole I can't do it right now. I'm just saying like I, you know, in a good on a good day, I can hit all that stuff. And I was feeling like I got to do it. I'm not going to cop out on it. If we're doing Aerosmith. I got to hit those parts. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, I just I love and Checkmate. I'm faithful like that. Like 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 sometimes we do songs our own way, but sometimes I'm just like, no, man, we're doing Aerosmith. Let me let's try, try to sound like Aerosmith. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean a lot of the covers are faithful. Then I look at some, something. Some like... we mess around with, but everyone's you know we mess around. It just I don't know. It just if if I feel like we could if we can pull it off sounding kind of like what the band you know like our version of what the band did, then we do that. If if it feels like it's a stretch or something, they may or or I have some unique idea, then maybe we pull it in a different direction. But I'm like, you know, if you're doing cheap trick, like you know, try to sound like cheap trick. Well, Bob Seger, uh, Bob Seger system, rambling, Love gambling Bob man. Se yeah, huge fan. Faithful, faithful for the most part, but it's all. It also feels a little more ramshackle, perhaps. Well, that's a live one from a radio show we did in um, Cleveland, I think. Um, but yeah, so that one and Taxi Driver, a few of them are just live. Like the thing is, we didn't go as far as taking stuff off like bootlegs and live. Like you know, if, if someone or even us brought a recorder in the room, of which we did many times, and we've got many cool recordings of both of us with famous you know rock stars doing cool shit but a lot of those recordings are like you know someone has brought in like a sony pro walkman yeah. like you know a walkman with a recorder essentially so the quality is not that that great for this because this is our really our first kind of archival collection I wanted the quality to be really good and everything. Yeah. So like we might do a part two, maybe where it's the bootleg stuff. We also have so many, like for every album, we, we would record demos for the entire album. And then there's tons of songs that we, that, sorry, that's my dog Mojo, um, that we didn't put out. So we've also thought about doing like an, all the demos and more that was just like a, a two disc set of just like all the demos we ever did. But I don't know. We'll see if people enjoy what we just did enough that it warrants putting out a part two. But, um, but yeah, I mean, we, we recorded a lot of stuff along the way and it was a lot of like demos of what we were doing originally and then covers and the covers made it to this. So maybe the other stuff will make it somewhere else. You know, you never know. Uh, a spot on version of Sonic Reducer. On yeah, one. that one's cool because that has Jimmy Zero from the Dead Boys. And we were on tour in in Cleveland where the Dead Boys are from. And uh, Jimmy Zero at the time had a band called Lesbian Maker. And we played the Euclid Tavern, I believe. I think we did two gigs with him over over a couple tours. But it was us and Wayne Kramer on tour. And we were also Wayne's backing band. So there was a while where we would do this thing with like Wayne and Sylvain and Jimmy and, and Cherie, where we would like tour with them and the cheetahs would do a support set of our original material or just whatever our set was at that time. And then we'd run backstage and, you know, change t-shirts and slug down a beer and then come back with the headliner and be the backing band. So for us, it was like two straight hours with maybe a five minute break of playing you know, or sometimes two and a half if you were playing with Wayne and he felt like just going off. And and it was so great because by the time you hit that second set, you were just like warmed up and ready to go. Yeah. Like we I would do a whole cheetah set singing and playing guitar. But then when I would 
play with Wayne, I was just playing rhythm guitar, some leads and some backing vocals, which is to say it was a little less high tension, you know, than having to be the lead singer. So it was sort of like way fun because I was already warmed up, but I didn't have to do quite as much heavy lifting. You know what I mean? I, I'm pretty sure as a musician that that was the that was the American dream right there, doing your, your mean, own music and then playing. Well, with yeah, Wayne. and then we would have like for instance, we went out with Wayne and then we hit Cleveland and Jimmy Zero joined us. So we had there was a jam we did that was us with Wayne and Jimmy Zero. And then the next morning we went into the studio and Jimmy produced and played on us doing Sonic Reducer. And then like we did when we played with Wayne, there was all sorts of cool stuff. He was playing with Brian James from the Dam, so there was a lot of jams with Brian James and Dennis Tech from Radio Birdman, and we were playing with Cherie a lot. Um, you know, there was just a lot of lot of cool rock people and legends that we were lucky enough to to team up with or play or meet through other people, and just you know, we were likable and young and drunk and enjoying ourselves and people seem to like hanging out with us or vice or didn't mind that we hung out with them and played with them and somehow we just wormed our way onto a lot of cool stuff and I, I think a lot of it was just that we were enthusiastic and nice you know like we we would generally you know like talk to people and we, we were nerdy and like you know, we knew everything about their career, but we also weren't, <laughs> act but we also weren't acting like fanboys. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, like, I don't know, like there's a way that you can hang out with someone that you dig and, and like be a fan without being a fanboy, if that makes a sense. Absolutely. Where you can be like, Hey man, like they know like, Oh dude, like this fellow musician respects me and knows my shit and is asking me some detailed ass questions that show they've really been paying attention. And you can have that conversation in a way where you don't come off like a sycophant or like a super nerd. Like you can have that as a peer where yes. even though I might be a young kid in my twenties back then talking to a legend like Wayne, but I'm also like on tour with him in his band in Missoula, Montana. And like, you know, meaning he's given me a hall pass at this point. And now I can just ask him questions when they come to me and not feel weird that I'm asking. I can be like, hey, man, yes. Wayne, when when you got when you and Rob Tyner would do this, what was that like? And he would give me an answer. And we, would you know, like I get to hear these rad stories. And that was kind of like the bonus of of being in the Cheetahs really was just like we got to team with all these unbelievable rock icons and like for me i gotta spend time just like in a van or backstage hanging out with them yeah. and asking all the questions i ever wanted to ask sheree curry or bob duro or wayne kramer or sylvain sylvain or dennis tech or jimmy zero or cheetah chrome or whoever you know you mentioned the stones and alice cooper is kind of those exemplars of bands who still inexplicably are at the top or the peak of their power, the peaks of their power yep. in, in the present day. I would put Iron Maiden on that same list. It, it, I, I just saw them most recently a couple of weeks ago for like the fifth time. And they're still, I mean, Bruce Dickinson's voice is still operatic and, and blistering the stage show with all the changes. Amazing. And I bring this up because you cover a very early Maiden song in the in this collection again the yeah collection. we started doing sanctuary off the first maiden record way back when like back in the 90s i mean maiden has always been and judas priest too i feel like those are metal bands that punks and motorhead obviously would be like the pinnacle mm -hmm. of that but those are metal bands that even the most punk rock punks go oh yes. well yeah that that's cool you know what i mean like you may not like metal but how do you not like iron maiden it's just so rad it's so cool you know and um i mean i would say that's definitely a band that we all love but like in the cheetahs dino everett our bass player um he was always sort of the more faithful punk in the band like he is a diehard avengers fan and crime fan and he like actually when he was a teenager played with gg allen like he's he's like a real you know og <laughs> punk i don't know that i would call myself a, a real punk like that don't get me wrong i love a lot of punk rock music and i have tons of punk rock records like i've been listening to fear since i was you know 10 years old um, the like I said, the Ramones, the New York Dolls, but I was always a little bit more on that kind of like proto seventies punk vibe, like the mm -hmm. the Runaways, Joan Jett, and stuff. And I like some hardcore stuff, and I love a lot of like you know thrash and stuff. But I wouldn't say that I was a like a hardcore punk the way that you think of. It. I was really more of like a metalhead and a hard rock kid who also loved punk. Mm -hmm. So while Dino 
and I say this because Dino and I and Art Jackson, we were the three guys that really started the band. Art's not in the band anymore, but he was an original member. And like, you know, I was kind of a metalhead. So I was more on the Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, Van Halen. Like I'm a rat fan. I love black and blue. I love Armored Saint. I yes. don't get me wrong. My all time favorite band is the Stones. I love Al Green. I love Parliament Funkadelic. I'm not saying like I'm just a metalhead. I have a, a, a big, sure. wide variety of tastes, especially now as an older man, as opposed to a kid um you know i have an appreciation for lots of, i'm a big jazz fan blah 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 but you know growing up i was a metalhead and dino was a punk and art was probably somewhere in between and so when the band formed we very much embraced all sides of this and dino was a punk who loved metal and i was a metalhead who loved punk so it wasn't really it didn't seem like we were reinventing the wheel by covering both Iron Maiden and the Dead Boys. It felt yeah. like, eh, you, you kind of play them around the same tempo and you're going to be fine. They just, you know, they're rock and roll songs, you know. And especially the early Maiden with Paul Deano is a lot more punk rock than the later Maiden stuff, which maybe gets into a bit more proggy territory, you know. Yeah, it was it was scrappier. Yeah, so, but I mean, I agree with you. Maiden is just a, a killer, amazing, incredible band. I'm really excited that Judas Priest got in the rock and roll hall of fame. Not that I'm necessarily a big, you know, subscriber that the rock and roll hall of fame is like the be all end all, but I like it when like hardcore, yeah, you, you, you hard you metal. Want, you want your rap. team to win. Yeah. 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 And I like it when NWA got in, like, sure. I mean, meaning I just like, I like it when hard edge music gets respect from the mainstream. So, you know, anytime like a metal band or something just really edgy makes it squeaks its way in there. I'm like, yeah. So now we wait for iron maiden. Yeah, I mean, that seems like next. I mean, and honestly, they've sold a lot of records and they're very relevant now. I mean, the, I mean, more than any concert this year, like when Maiden played, every single person I know went to that show. I feel like they're still very relevant. So, well, I and you want like to talk for how, how instructive are they as uh, learning how to brand your band? That's a master yeah, class in branding. Abso absolutely. Uh, they're, and they're just a great band. I mean, and also the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in particular is so much about record sales and Iron Maiden has sold a lot of records. Like they're not, sure. you know what I mean? It's not like uh, they're not fringe anymore. I mean, when you go to see their show, it's almost like the metal version of Disney on Ice at this point in that it is a yes. big, it's big, a production. big show. Yeah. It's a production. And the reason why they can afford to do that kind of production on the road like this is because they sell a lot of records and they are a big A-list act at this point. I mean, you know, maybe you could argue for a long time the Maiden was a fringe thing, but like not now. Nope. They are a big, big, big band. They're at Sabbath Ozzy level. Like they are as big, you know, right up there with Metallica. Like they are doing a big, massive show that has, you know, production value. It's not just a heavy metal concert, you know. You just named the other one that I think is a head scratcher for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Ozzy Solo. Not oh, for sure. For sure. I mean, I personally, I mean, I'm a Sabbath nut. I love those first two Ozzy records with Randy sure. to me are just the greatest. I'm kind of hit and miss with the rest of his stuff, but no doubt that he's a legend and a great singer and songwriter and performer. And, and I mean, man, those, those, the Sabbath stuff is untouchably incredible. And those two records with Randy are, they're almost like the blueprint of pop metal. You know, I feel like I hear rat, that rat and Def Leppard and quiet riot and all the stuff that came right after it. You could kind of make, I mean, you know, certainly Van Halen and there's a couple other people that were doing like that, that sort of combination of like heavy metal guitar with really pop hooks. There were certainly other people doing it, but when you listen to those first two Ozzy records, like that is the blueprint of, oh, when, yes. of, of heavy metal on the radio for the next decade. Hey, just earlier this evening before our conversation my son was cooking dinner he's he's in culinary school and he was listening to over the mountain as he was cooking i'm like oh th th this gives me hope like i was smiling broadly as i walked my to daughter the is 19 and she's a sophomore in college she's also a big cook and she also loves uh black sabbath and early ozzy so uh, we're raising good kids we're doing the right thing here that's right now controversial opinion i may like the dio dio sabbath more than ozzy sabbath I had that argument with uh, Ahmet Zappa. We were talking about the Kiss Cruise earlier, and he and I had that argument. And he makes, as I'm sure you would, the case that in two albums, Heaven and Hell in the Mind, arguably, yeah, yeah. I mean, because they did more stuff, you know, and, yeah, yeah. and then the 
the band Heaven and Hell, but like in mm. those two albums that that they essentially said everything that that Ozzy managed to say over the course of the eight albums and that there's not a bad song on those two albums. Now, I agree that those are two absolutely amazing records. For me personally, I'm more of an Ozzy guy than a Dio guy. Um, I don't know why, but I would just say that Dio always had a little bit of that rock opera Mm -hmm. kind of vibe in his voice, and Ozzy, to me, always kind of sounds like just a melodic rock and roll singer. Don't get me wrong. Later, Ozzy, the way his voice is now, it's very processed and it's very, but like back in the day, Ozzy was just a rock and roll singer with a really, really good, like melodic voice when he, you know, when he would go there. Um, So for me, I'm an Ozzy guy, but don't get me wrong. There's, you cannot understate the magical majesty and swordsmanship of uh of uh, of a lyrical prowess of of the cauldron of dragons and dungeons and mighty warlocks that is ronnie james dio and and my buddy amit would tell you if i said anything short of dio as god then i would be struck down stricken down by the metal gods themselves which of course we know is rob halford so Clearly, uh, again, the compilation, all the covers and more uh, not on vinyl. No, not yet, although we're in talks with the label right now. Uh, I don't I, I won't reveal it quite yet, but um, to do a vinyl version, but it'll be a one album version that is essentially all these short songs. And I say that because if you've looked at the time length as two CDs, they both clock in around 72, 74 minutes. So in order to do, and by the way, the gauntlet has been drawn, like any label that wants to do a four album disc, you know, four vinyl, I'm into it. Like you just reach out to me, we're down. But the reality is no one has the the cojones of steel Mm -hmm. uh you would have to carry your balls in a wheelbarrow to do the the four album you know version so in lieu of that this label we're talking to is going to basically take off all the super long jams with wayne kramer and sylvain and and all that jazz and like just put out kind of like the shorter rock punk rock stuff and make like a one album version. so we'll be on vinyl soon really right now it's just cd Brilliant. And people can stream it. Obviously, they can also, like you said, get it on listening compact disc. Yeah. Our the label we did this record with is called Rumbar. It's a great label, uh, East Coast, Boston based label. A guy named Lou runs it. Really good. They're, they just like they love music. They're just big music fans. They're in it for all the right reasons. Like, you know, th- these days there's not a lot of labels that are just committed to putting out rock and roll records. And the ones that are doing it are generally doing it because they love it. Yeah. And they're fans, just like, you know, just like we've been talking about, like we're fans of this. This is why we do it. This is why I do it. So we were lucky enough to hook up with this label and they were fans of the band. And I ran this idea by them and they were into it. And we're talking about doing more stuff with them. Really, really big fans of them. Um, And, you know, we've been doing this for a while, which is to say that like, we're kind of in a nice position where like we're not a huge band by any means, but the street walking cheetahs have been around for 25 years now. And there's a lot of people that were fans of us that now run record labels. And so there's people that are into the idea of putting out some new music or some archival stuff of which we have plenty of both. So we found an audience and a a sort of home in these different indie labels in Europe and, and the States for us to do that. And then, you know, my whole thing is, you know, at some point, I branched off from the cheetahs and kind of started my own career. So I've, you know, I did a record with Eddie spaghetti from the super suckers last year called motherfucking rock and roll. It was kind of like those old records when like Waylon Jennings and Willie Nelson would like two outlaw, you know, country guys hook up and do a record together. We made like our outlaw country rock and roll record. And then I met these guys from the band warrior soul and city kids in the UK. And we started a band based out of Copenhagen called trading aces I've got a blues band called Highway 61. I record with James Williamson from the Stooges, this heavy metal guy out of Canada called Thor, Cherie Curry from the Runaways, and I have some new Thor. Yeah, Thor. And and so, you know, my whole thing is just I've got, and then I've, you know, and all this stuff, like a lot of it's on labels, a lot of it's on my band camp. You can just go to the band camp or the social media for any of my projects. But my whole thing is just like, I'm a songwriter, you know, I write songs in lots of different zones. There's metal, there's punk, there's rock and roll, there's country, there's blues. And I just keep trying to like 
move forward and just keep writing and writing and writing and putting out stuff. I also write books and I make movies. Mm -hmm. I've directed three documentary films and written eight books. And so my whole thing is I just keep like making, making art, you know, I just keep making art and moving forward. You mentioned Eddie Spaghetti. The first time I saw Super Suckers was the weirdest. They were touring with White Zombie in the mid 90s, which was not a perfect fit. I I, I don't know that the White Zombie fans knew. Probably not. Yeah. Eddie, Eddie's a lot of Eddie's careers is Super Suckers being paired up with bands that that is not a perfect fit. But that's what makes him such a fucking rad outlaw, you know? (laughs) It totally. All right. See, we you mentioned all the other stuff you do as an author, a producer, documentarian, director. All this is to say, and based on this conversation, you're a storyteller. That that's what you do. Absolutely. Yeah. What makes musicians, what makes the music industry worthy of telling stories or good subjects, I should say? Well, there's all sorts of ways that you can tell stories. And so when I do a documentary film or a book, for instance. Um, and I would say I, in those realms, I generally am a nonfiction person. So I don't do a lot of like, I don't write books where I just come up with a, a fanciful idea. I, I, I wrote like a history of the Ramones or I ghost wrote a, or I, you know, worked with Dave Mustaine uh, from Megadeth on one of his books. I did the, you know, I, I par- partnered up with Monty Melnick, the tour manager of the Ramones, helped him tell his story. So I do a lot of nonfiction stuff. And when you're doing nonfiction, like a documentary film or a book, you're there to serve the best uh, telling of that story. So my voice is not as important in that I might, as a professional writer who can sometimes frame stuff or might be like the narrative voice or something, I might jump in there. But, you know, I'm almost helping other people like tell like I'm helping them achieve their voice and tell their story. And so I'm a co-author or sort of a, a narrator or a supporter or whatever you call it, ghostwriter, it depends on the gig. Um, and when you're doing a documentary, it's that same kind of thing. Like it's a bit of a fly on the wall thing. It's my opinion is not as valuable beyond just what's the best way to keep this all moving forward and to tell or capture this, this story. And that's one way to tell st- a story and that's a longer form way in the sense that when you're doing a book or a movie you know that's going to be like an a 90 minute experience or if you're reading a book maybe a three four five six hour experience you know whatever and you have uh you have that that room to breathe a little bit when you're writing a song for one thing you don't really have to worry about the definition of fiction and nonfiction. Mm-hmm. It's all you know, like I can write a song that's both simultaneously. Yeah, this is a song about me robbing a bank, but it's kind of about my marriage. You know what I mean? Like, like you know, you can you can do whatever. You could write a song like "Wooly Bully" that just means nothing and it's just yes. nonsense, but somehow just you know, "Baba Ooh Mao Mao." I mean, like that that doesn't mean anything. There's all these great '60s songs, mm-hmm. you know, uh, "Louie Louie" that just don't mean anything, but they're like incredible because sometimes it's just the phrasing of the word and the energy. And then sometimes you've got a Bob Dylan or a Springsteen who tells these beautiful poetic stories like a Patti Smith. And then you've got guys like Didi Ramone who could just summarize all these complex emotions in like four words, you know, and then just repeat those four words. And then when you get the next verse, just go, you know, second verse, same as the first, <laughs> which is like the greatest second verse ever. It is. You know what I mean? So like there's so many ways when you're writing songs, um, there's so many voices you can take. And there's so many ways to interpret it and you can write a two minute song or a 20 minute song and it can be steeped in nonfiction or fiction. So what I love about songwriting is that it forces you to be very compact. Mm -hmm. Now, even if your compact idea is eight minutes long versus 30 seconds long. And, you know, if you're in DRI, you might write a 30 second hardcore song. If you're in Emerson, Lake and Palmer, you might write an eight minute long prog opus. Both of those have meaning and have weight. And like, in my mind, I'm like, well, I mean, I'd like to think now 51, I'm 51 years old at this point in the game, I could go in either direction. It's more like, what's my idea. Mm -hmm. So I've kind of feel like this whole journey to me has just been about being able to take the ideas in my brain and, or the ideas that I come up with collaborating with other artists and weirdos like me 
and then be able to sort of perfectly execute them either on stage or in the studio and get those ideas out so that then me as a nerdy rock fan can like listen to them and go, oh, yeah, that's cool. This song reminds me of the New York Dolls meets Cheap Trick meets Zappa, the way that I thought in my head. Because every time you write a song or make a movie or write a book, you're kind of like just pulling influences. You know, what sure. I mean? when I write a song, I'm like, oh, this is kind of like that Rick Springfield line, but with like a little cheap trick. And then it kind of does a little rap thing. And then it's like DRI. You know what I mean? And then like when I'm making a movie, <laughs> you know, I'm making like, like I made, directed a movie about this, this movie called Risen, the story of Shron Hellraiser Smith. And it's about a Wu-Tang Clan rapper who had a um, a brain aneurysm and lost the whole left side of his body and had to like relearn to rap and walk and talk and and all this stuff. And like when I'm in that zone, my I'm not taking the driver's seat and pushing right. the idea and the creative. I'm taking the back seat and letting him or his life, you know, or whatever. He's he's sort of pushing the creative, you know what I mean? Or pushing the narrative. And I'm just there as a fly on the wall. So I always feel like it's the same reason why in the Cheetahs I can be the lead singer, but in Cherie Curry's band, I'm the rhythm guitar player or the co-songwriter, right. like Sometimes you got to be the quarterback and sometimes you're the wide receiver, you know, listening to you talk about about music in general over this conversation. And just by the way, my my wife, I just got married three weeks ago, would be so thrilled at the football analogy that I just did, because I'm so not a sports guy, but I've been watching a lot more football, you know, in the, like since I met her. And of course, now that I'm married. And uh, I, I've made a few casual football references recently, and she's like, oh, I'm getting in there. I'm getting in that head. <laughs> I think we're all proud of you, Frank. Thanks, um, but listen, you to you, listen to you talk about music and just the, the depth of music and the enthusiasm, the passion you have for music. And then hearing you mention DRI and Emerson, Lake and Palmer in the same sentence reminds me of I, what I, for me, was the most liberating thing I experienced 10, 20 years ago getting rid of the idea that there are guilty pleasures in music and just liking yep. the shit you like. And I think yep. people get so hung up. You can love a Rick Springfield song. You could be all about the working class dog album, but also listen to discipline by King Crimson or whatever. Absolutely. I mean, I, I've been a huge, huge hip hop fan for a long, long time. And there's no evidence of that in my rock music. Because I just don't feel like it belongs in there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Meaning that's if if that influence shows, it shows when I'm making my documentaries uh, about hip hop artists, of which I've made two now. Uh, but I've always loved that and and found a real energy and creative sort of inspiration from hip hop. But it, but I but I'm not a guy who feels like I need to then go make a rap rock record yeah. or start rapping. It's more like I just kind of have always loved, you know, this music from when I heard Public Enemy as a kid. Yeah. I just like I loved it. I, it means something to me and it connects with me. And I've I've done a lot of storytelling in the hip hop world as a musician and also as a documentarian. But but I don't feel the need to mix it with my rock and roll and mm -hmm. some people do and that's fine it's just that to me i have these different sides of my personality you know i'm a big blues guy and other than maybe some licks in my guitar playing i don't necessarily feel like you'd hear the tremendous buddy guy influence in my overall musicianship or the john lee hooker influence because it's just you know there's ways i could probably hear it seeping in there but for the most part it's just not necessarily appropriate within the street walk and cheetahs world but like you know it takes all these different things to i'm a huge olivia newton john fan i'm a huge donna summer fan huge my wife and i went and saw diana ross recently in concert like i fucking love motown and soul yeah oh yeah like 60s pop and 70s pop like i told you i'm a huge hip-hop fan like i have a lot of influences that are just not evident in my music because because if you're doing dead boys rock and roll it's just not appropriate to bring in your son raw influence although like actually kind of is in maybe that. and yeah. that wasn't a good example because <laughs> actually the cheetahs do a fair amount of bringing in punk and freeform jazz together but you know what i'm saying like you can compartmentalize like you can be a music fan like like you were saying like there's no guilty pleasures like i was telling you about tommy thayer from kiss like 
I non-ironically love his yes. 80s band Black and Blue. I'm a huge fan of Armored Saint, who used to dress in armor and wield swords and play metal. But I like them now. I like their current album, God damn it. You know what I mean? Like, I'm a fan of the stuff that I like. I will ride or die with that stuff till till the day they stop mu- making music. If John Bush is singing a metal song, I'm buying that record. Like, because that guy, you know, he's to me like, that's the singer of Armored Saint, who also was an anthrax. Right. But like, you know, to me, like that guy, if he's making a record, I want to hear it. I, I think Safe Home, that an anthrax song from the early aughts that John Bush was on, was a fantastic single that should have been a big deal. I just think, yeah, I agree with you. And I just think he's one of those guys. And I could name a lot of musicians like this where, you know, like, look, I understand that, like, you know, Saxon influenced power metal may not be the the hippest thing, you know, to 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 like with these with the kids, whatever the kids are. But I'm just saying, like, I love that music. And when I hear it done right, it really means something to me. And a guy like John Bush, for instance, and there's a lot of musicians we could have this conversation about, but just because we brought him up like that guy has faithfully been a great metal singer for oh, yeah. a long time. And when I listen to metal the way my voice is, like if I sing metal, like when I write for Thor or I sing with Thor or I, I had a band called the Doberman, which was me and guys from Gacy DC and Pansy Division and stuff. And we were doing kind of like metal and like when I or trading aces even does some metal stuff, my band in Copenhagen. When you hear me sing metal, I'm singing like John Bush. Like that's just me doing John Bush. Like that is my my brain just processes because my voice <laughs> is very much in that same pocket yeah. as his. And I can kind of do some of the same stuff. So like I just sing like John Bush. So I have sort of zones, you know, and that's what we're saying. Like, like when I sing punk, I, I, there's like two or three guys that I, in my head, I go like, I'm just sort of doing those guys. When I'm singing pop, I'm doing Robin Zander. When I'm singing metal, I'm doing John Bush, you know? And that's like, I don't know if that's a cool answer, but like you said, like, we love what we love. Like, I don't feel, I, I, I don't feel weird about it anymore. Like I love what I love. And, and like, I don't care that I think MC Ren was the greatest rapper in NWA. Like, Sorry, I just think it. You mentioned the blues and you also mentioned the term guitar lick. I sometimes as a non-player, even though I did take a year of Fender play during the pandemic. Uh, Which, I sometimes, by the way, you know, I directed all, a lot of those I, videos. I, for a long I know. Time. That's yeah, why I bring yeah. it up. Yeah. Oh, but right. I sometimes confuse riff and lick. So, for instance, Smokestack Lightning. Is that a riff or a lick? That's a riff. Generally, uh, the way to differentiate. So the background you were to say. So I worked. My normal job away from uh, being a rock and roll uh, songwriter and singer and uh, guitar player is I'm a director and I've directed a bunch of documentary movies and I've written a bunch of books, but that's sort of in the same zone as being a director. And um, and I've directed for a, a lot of digital companies. So I worked for Fender and for about four years, like right before they started Fender Play, and I had a lot to do with what Fender Play was from a video and production angle um i worked you know i directed these digital videos and then i went on to a company called tonal which is like digital weightlifting it's sort of like the digital weightlifting uh what, what peloton is to uh cycling and digital you know yeah so this is you've seen the commercials with lebron and serena and stuff so i direct a lot of those videos as well and um a lot of my experience as a musician and being on camera and, you know, has informed me being behind the camera. So that's what I do is I write books and I, and I direct and stuff. And, um, God, I forgot what your question was. I went off on a second there. Sorry. I said riff, traveling. Riff, oh yeah. Riff versus like, which is to say that, um, I don't even know why I went down that path, but, oh, going back to Fender. So yeah. So yeah. for a long time, I directed Fender stuff. And this question came up often in the world of Fender, which is what's the difference between a lick and a riff. And here's, sorry to go off track there. Here's the difference to me. A riff is like, the beginning of the song or the memorable part of the song that is not necessarily part of a vocal. So in in um, my Sharona, dun, 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 you know what I mean? In Whip It, dun, 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 dun. in Living After Midnight, dun, 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 dun. it's that part of the song yeah. that sort of starts it off 
gives you the personality of the song, sometimes hints at the melody or mm-hmm. the chorus, but sort of encapsulizes what the song is going to be before the vocal even comes in. That's basically what a riff is. A lick is more like a melody line. So a lick would be like in Running With The Devil, the lick is da na 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 the riff would be gan gan. Yep. Okay. You know what I mean? Meaning the song starts off with the riff that dun dun over the bass line. That tells you what the song's about. But then all of a sudden there's this melody line. That's kind of the difference. Like I'll running with the devil is the perfect example of the difference between a lick and a riff, and that is it. And so one is essentially a melody line that often hints at the vocal line or the main melody, but not always like in running with the devil. It's Mm -hmm. not the melody line. It's just sort of a complimentary part that complements it and fits in, but it's just as memorable as the vocal line. Uh, So it serves as an additional melody line essentially. And so that's, that's really, and so a lot of times people will confuse a guitar solo with the lick. A guitar solo is a collection of licks but the difference is that a lot of guitar solos are improvised. And so if you're lucky and you're an Eddie Van Halen or an Eric Clapton or whatever, you might, you know, you or a, like Mark Knopfler or, um, you know, a Pink Floyd, perfect example. Like the guitar lines are so melodic that, you know, these licks become like memorable melodic mm-hmm. things that you remember. Whereas sure. if you listen to Ingve Malmsteen, it's just a flurry of notes and you're not necessarily walking away. So like a guitar solo is sort of an opportunity for the soloist in the band to either remind you of the melody line or encapsulate kind of like a, a, a version of the melody line, but instrumentally, or if they're just shredding, it's just a chance for them to break away from the melody line and do something dazzling and or interesting. You know what I mean? That was really well articulated. That was exactly that was exactly the answer I was looking for. Thank you for that. All right. So to take it back to Streetwalk and Cheetahs, all the covers and more. It is a collection of thirty eight covers. Uh, it, this is foundational rock and roll stuff. Foundational yeah. punk rock. It, it, it's stuff that that'll stir everything inside of you. You can get it on CD. You can stream it. It's awesome. And in theory, we'll be getting a, a condensed uh, digest version on vinyl in in months to come. i would like to see that happen because i'm a big vinyl guy so I, li- I like vinyl how can you not be i mean we're we're of comparable age and interest i, I would imagine you have a nice little record I collection up, yeah i sure do i sure do it's right over here <laughs> awesome all right street walking cheetahs love the band even the the studio album the most recent one is right behind me that sounds awesome thank you guys man. you guys are great I, I really appreciate talking to you tonight thank you man yeah that last record one more drink came out on deadbeat records and that was like our first studio record in many many years and it's actually probably it might be the only record we've ever done with no covers and i think it was just because we had not made a record in so long that we were like well let's come out and remind people that we can actually write songs as well um but then we immediately followed up with two discs of an unbelievable amount of covers so you know the bottom line is like you said at the beginning of this interview is that we wear our influences on our sleeves uh so i think people that like you know reckless chainsaw rock and roll whether it's metal or punk or bob seger or whatever are gonna dig what we do and um if you if you're someone who's on the social medias you know on instagram where the street walking cheetahs on Facebook, the Street Walking Cheetahs. Uh, you can look us me up as uh, the Frank Meyer on Instagram or Frank M Meyer, just Frank Meyer. I've got a bunch of Facebooks and stuff. Um, so yeah, when we're out there, just making more music, man. I'm I'm doing another this year. I'm gonna make another record with Eddie Spaghetti. The yes. Cheetahs are heading into the studio to do another record. I'm doing a record with uh, Trading Aces, which is my Copenhagen band. I did a record with them that's coming out in a few months, and I just made an album with this blues band, Highway 61, that I started in the 90s and finally got back together and knocked out a record. So this year I've got um, four albums coming out, which, believe it or not, for me is sort of a slow year. Normally I tend to operate between the two and eight albums a year clip. So and, and then so there's the- this year there'll be like, Four, and then there's the mystery unnamed whatever you were doing with Ahmed Zappa. 
Yes, and then there's this TV thing with Ahmed Zappa, but Ahmed and I go way back, man. I can tell you, dude, I grew up in the Frank Zappa house. Like, I can tell you, we could do a whole separate podcast about my years at the Zappa household, the Zappa compound. Uh, and Ahmed is a great guy, man. I love that guy. He He's one of the funniest. He is one of the funniest, most genuine people I know. I, I really, uh, really love that guy. Awesome. All right, Frank, I appreciate you doing this. Thanks, man. Appreciate you.